grazie a, a, a questa magnifica, magnifica idea di, di eh, traernos a tutti punti. Sì. Eh, 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 sì, eh, sono la, la prima eh, relatora nel il pomeriggio e eh, eh, sarei contenta se alla fine del mio relatore eh, lei eh, comprende eh, qual è il ruolo del, della conferenza della AIA e perché la conferenza della AIA ha anche qualcosa a dire sulle, sul tema che, che trattiamo eh, oggi. I'm going to now get to, to English. Um, this morning we already uh, discussed uh, from very different details this new uh, development uh, at the European uh, Union. Um, I think it suffices to look at my title, very long title of my presentation, to understand that uh, I had quite some uh, difficulty in uh, bringing it all in a concise presentation. It's also the first presentation after our uh, lunch, so I understand that I'm here uh, before a difficult task. So I think I would like uh, just to reflect with you about two key aspects in the title of my presentation. And one is, uh, of course, as the first speaker, I'm going to give some uh, introduction about the institutional framework for the enforcement of um, those rights. I'm going to do that, and that's the second aspect, I'm going to do that from the perspective of the Hague Conference. The first of the parameters that I'm imposing myself allows me to focus on what has been presented this morning as an important pillar of the system, the fact that we need some organizational framework, we need some um, common um, structure to litigate those patterns. The second one will uh, allow me to present that, those ideas from the perspective of an organization, most of you may know it, but as we are here in an interdisciplinary um, context, I think it is also important to say that the Hague Conference on Private International Law is an organization, intergovernmental organization, and so I'm also here to, I, I, I imagine, defend the advantages of intergovernmental cooperation. Um, and the area in which uh, the organization operates is the um, cross-border cooperation in civil and commercial matters, a very broad area. And so perhaps some of you at this stage wonder what specifically uh, is uh, the link between something as specific as uh, patent rights and the work of the Hague Conference. At this stage, I think I should say that uh, before I turn to, to that question, I would like to add a personal note because um, like many, I think, in this uh, audience, and certainly among the, the speakers today, um, I did my PhD dissertation on this very same aspect, the cross-border enforcement of patent rights. And already then, I plead for some kind of consolidation of uh, litigation in this area. I was convinced that this was what uh, we all need, both from the perspective of the industry and from the perspective of uh, citizens. Um, and I am from that, let's say, research that I conducted at the university in a neutral way, very optimistic and convinced that this is a good development, one that of course has a certain um, shortcomings and uh, issues that have to be addressed, but uh, the underlying objective of uh, this uh, uh, evolution, I think, is one that has to be applauded and one that has to be supported. Let me also say that, as was said, I think by some speakers, I, I, I think uh, Professor Di, Di Cataldo this morning uh, made us also uh, believe that we have to um, think about the practical consequences for the litigants, the practical consequences for the engineers and all those that hold the uh, patent holders. And, uh, and that also, I think, is, is something that is dear to my heart, being married to a, an engineer who is patent holder and who keeps asking me all these questions about why we lawyers make it so complicated. And I have to 
yes, I must say that I have difficulties finding a convincing answer. Uh, so I think here I would also like from that perspective, from that very personal private uh, perspective, tell you that um, I think we are here to discuss, but also to try to work together uh, in order to create something that at the end of the day will help those people who are uh, the benefit, the, the, those who should benefit from, from our work, the patent uh, industry, but also the, the, the inventors, and through their work, the, the, the whole um, society. I, I would not want to, to make you believe that uh, because of, of these, uh, let's say, more personal uh, imp impressions of mine, I'm not uh, here in another capacity than the one of the, of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And that's where I think I should go back to the question, what has the Hague Conference to do with the, this whole area, this whole discussion we, we are uh, addressing uh, today? Well, I think uh, to give an answer, a convincing answer to, to that question, I have to look into the UPC agreement, the European Patent uh, Court Agreement, and uh, see with you, and you have uh, that uh, agreement in your documentation, that Article 31, when it uh, relates to that very, same, uh, that very specific question of the litigation framework, says in Article 31, and I quote, the international jurisdiction of the court shall be established in accordance with regulation that we, private international lawyers, called the Brussels I recast regulation and were applic applicable on the basis on the Convention on Jurisdiction and the Recognition and Enforcement of Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters, the Lugano Convention. So th that, is the in, uh, that is the institutional framework, a reference to the Brussels I recast regulation, a uh, regulation that will enter into force in 2015. And so um, that, I think, is how this instrument or this uh, development of the European Patent Court Agreement becomes very relevant to the Hague Conference. Why? From the perspective of the Hague Conference, we will then have to be very careful, and it, we will have in the Hague to be very attentive, that uh, this uh, new institutional framework does not forget yet another international instrument yet another instrument that has not yet entered into force, the 2005 Choice of Court Convention of the Hague Conference. So, in fact, the main idea that I would like to put to you is that there is a need when integrating the um, European, European Patent Court Agreement within the system of Brussels I, there is a need to also take into consideration this new international agreement that is about to enter into force. Let me explain. I'm going to do that from the perspective of the substantive scope of application of this convention. I realize that this is a new element that perhaps has not yet been um, added to the equation, and I know that there have already been many, many uh, challenges and aspects um, highlighted this morning, but I think it is my role as an official of the Hague Conference to yet add this new one to the, this discussion. Substantive scope of the Convention. The Convention applies to choice of court agreements concerning disputes where the validity of a registered IP right is challenged as a defense. So we are talking about choice of court agreements included in, say, a license, and whether the validity of the patent right is, is uh, raised as a, a def defense or not does not change the fact that this convention will apply. So, substantive, uh, so from the perspective of the, of the ratione materia, you see that there is there an overlap of this instrument, the choice of court convention, and the institutional framework that will operate to deal with uh, EU patents. Then the question arises, so is the European Union or is, are the member states of the European Union parties to that uh, international convention? And the answer right now is no, but I have to say that the answer in 2015 should be yes. And why am I uh, so affirmative? 
because uh, the European Union and the European Union has exclusive competence to deal with this international agreement because of the exclusive competence um, in the area of Brussels I. So the European Union has already signed this international agreement and my uh, discussions with, with the, uh, Mr. Koenig's uh, colleagues at uh, Justice make me believe that as soon as next month they will also issue the proposal for ratification of this choice of court agreement. So I think this is something that uh, has to be also part of the equation. I'm not saying that uh, um, there will not be a way to articulate all these instruments, but I think it uh, um, makes me believe that in the context of the creation of this uh, litigational framework, the Hague Conference on Private International Law should also um, at least follow this process and, where necessary, um, assist the European Union, which is, by the way, a member of the organization. So even if it's an intergovernmental organization, the European Union is um, part of it. Um, assist in, in that process so that we find a way to deal with this overlap or um, overlap of, of in international instruments. I could have gone into the details and uh, refer to you um, Article 26 of the sa very same convention that I think is relevant in that matter. And I, would, I, I have a, an outline that explains this all in detail. But I thought that the technicalities at this stage are not that important. And it was more important to just from the perspective of the Hague Conference, say that this choice of court uh, convention is um, also to be taken into consideration. Having said so, I think that the last uh, uh, minutes of my presentation should uh, be devoted to uh, what we learn at the Hague Conference from this very significant um, evolution uh, at the level of the European Union. More than anything else, I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn from different experts in different disciplines and how they uh, experience this uh, creation of a uni unitary patent um, court. Why? Because at the Hague Conference, within the broader context in which we operate, right now 74 members of the organization in all the continents of the world and in, as I said, including the European Union, the discussion as to how best to enforce patent rights has been an issue and a difficult issue for many decades as well. You know, we heard this morning very much the argument, yeah, it has taken us more than 50 years. So really, now that we have a, an, an agreement, uh, it's good and let's take it as, as it is uh, and, and not be too critical. And while I see, let's say, some um, justification for that approach, I think that in this uh, specifically framework, in the specific framework, we should be a little bit more critical and we should also learn from the shortcomings. I am referring to uh, the work that within the context of the Hague Conference has received the name of Judgments Project. The Judgments Project is a big, big, uh, challenging project to create rules on international jurisdiction and on recognition and enforcement in the broader area of civil and commercial matters. And here, of course, the question is, and what about patent rights? What about the enforcement rights? Or even more generally, what about the enforcement of intellectual property rights? Do we have to also address them in that particular project? And for decades, the, the countries have uh, discussed it and without, for the time being, reaching a compromise. I think that I understand that right now there is a need for an inward-looking perspective for the European Union and also well, this new actor, the European Patent Office, being part of, of the structure that is being created. So it is very understandable that for the moment, the whole debate is focusing on how these uh, new structures will be put in place. But I would like somehow to zoom out and um, invite 
all the, the, the specialists to think as well about the situation beyond Europe. Because, as was said this morning, like 40% of uh, the, the patent holders are from outside the European Union. The, the disputes in uh, patent rights do not uh, stop at the European borders. I think we are all aware of that. So when time is ripe, and I don't think now the time is, has already come, but when time is ripe, I think the European Union should also look to the outside world and try to think about some arrangements to be made with uh, other big trading partners. I think we have uh, since, um, well, in the past, in the, in the very same period of time, we have had very important contributions from academia. I'm thinking here about the work that has been conducted by the Max Planck Institute, uh, the CLIP group, the ALI principles, the ja Japanese uh, joint proposal, um, uh, sorry, the Japanese transparency proposal and uh, a joint proposal between uh, the private international law association of Korea and the uh, and a Japanese uh, university. So we have seen that academia is aware that they, there is a need for some kind of international cooperation in this particular area of patent enforcement, also in general, intellectual property enforcement. And here my invitation would be that whenever the whole inward looking picture is uh, somehow clearer, and we wish, of course, that that will be the case, those European Union developments will also inspire us and will inspire the Hague Conference as the, I think, natural forum to conduct those discussions, to uh, extrapolate and to create some uh, forms of international uh, arrangements. Well, I think for now I would like to leave it for that. I thank you very much again, the, the speakers, for allowing me and allowing the Hague Conference to be part of this debate, uh, also to zoom out to uh, the world. And of course, I am now very interested in hearing the other uh, presentations with more specific aspects um, of this new litigational framework. Thank you very much. Thank you.